starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order. Please note, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending, uh, please everyone uh, mute your uh, computers until it's time to speak. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and the Governor's March 15th order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, as well as Mayor Court Attorney's declaration of emergency dated March 15, 2020, this meeting of the Sea Council will be conducted via remote participation. We will post an audio recording, audio video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of these proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the City of Somerville website and local cable ga access government channels. Now please rise for the prayer and pledge of allegiance. Mr. President, let's begin this meeting with a prayer. God grant this city council the serenity to accept the things that cannot be changed, the courage to change the things that can be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. And now let's join in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. This is roll call. Councillor Niedergang. Here. Councillor White. Here. Councillor Ballantyne. Here. Councillor Ewan Campen. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Strezzo. Here. Councillor Klingen. Present. Councillor Rumba. Present. Councillor Scott. Present. Councillor Rossetti. Present. And Councillor McLaughlin. Here. Mr. President, all 11 councillors are present. We have a quorum. Do we have any moments of silence? I have Councillor Strezzo, Ballantyne, and White. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I wanted to have a, uh, just give a moment of silence to Barbara Davidopoulos. A Ward 6 resident, she passed away last week as a result of a heart attack. She was a gentle spirit and she was beloved in her community. I used to love seeing her walk along College Avenue. And if I was in my car, I would sometimes pull over and wave, hi, Barbara. And if I had a moment, I'd pull over, run over, hug her. And, and then she would often say, I love you. And then I would get back in my car and drive off. She will be missed. Council Davis would like to sign on. Uh, Council Ballantyne. Thank you, Mr. President. So this moment of silence is for the 73 residents who have died due to COVID. And that's that's up from 50 just in since the last time the, excuse me, uh, it's up from the number of 50, so it's 23 since the last time that the city council met. And, and this evening, I thought I would read a poem uh, in remembrance of the 73 residents. And the poem is by Anna Barabald, and it's called The New Life Salutation. Life, we've been long together through pleasant and through cloudy weather. Tis heart to part when friends are dear. Perhaps twill cost a sigh, a tear. Then steal away, give little warning, choose thy own time. Say not good night, but in some brighter clime, bid me good morning. Thank you. Councilor White. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like a moment of silence for uh, Savita Coretti, who was 89 years of age, um, was the beloved wife of Antonio Tony Coretti, who was a son of a resident. Um, she's the mother of Mary Coretti, with whom I graduated in high school. She's now a doctor in Maryland. And uh, Linda Bohan, who was on the planning board um, many years ago, so I'm sure if she'd been on it, she would have voted against the foot waiver, um, and her husband, Larry of Somerville, and also Christine and Carol and Coretti, both of Somerville. Um, he came to this country in 1952 and um, 
like many, many Somerville residents, came from a very humble background. Um, you know, they came to the United States to make a new life, you know, raise their children, and, you know, were a part of Somerville tradition and culture that, you know, as time passes now, we're, we're sort of losing it. And I think it's an important memory um, that we should keep in our minds, but, you know, the contribution that these folks made. And the one thing I do know about Savita was she was an excellent cook. Um, a lot of the, the Italians who, who came, uh, you know, again, from humble backgrounds, they made tremendous meals out of very simple ingredients. And um, I know Savita was uh, very good at that and also for the sweets. Um, the cakes um, were really delicious. But anyway, I, I hope that we all hold her in our memory and that she rests in peace. Thank you. Councilor Rossetti would like to sign on. Councilor Klingen. Mr. President, thank you. Um, I just want to have a mo uh, add to this moment of silence. Um, the two individuals who died on the job in Boston uh, uh, just yesterday, uh, Mr. Jordan Romero and Carlos Gutierrez, um, they tragically lost their lives while, while working in, uh, on a construction site in Boston. I just want to keep their family in our um, thoughts tonight. Thank you. Are there any further moments of silence? Please rise for a moment of silence. Please be seated. Mr. Clerk, please read the next item. Item number three is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of January 28th. All right, this item is laid on the table for approval. Uh, now, before we get into the agenda, uh, there are a number of items councilors have requested to take out of order. Uh, Council Ewan Camper would like to take item number 22, which has to do with civilian review out of order. Uh, item number 45, uh, Council Klingon would like to take out of order, or Council Ballantyne would like to take out of order uh, and sponsor a speaker. Uh, and then items number 29, 33, and 31, uh, let's see, 29, 33, 31, and 32 are all confirmations. Um, the Councilor Rossetti would like to take out of order. And then finally, the city has requested we take item number 42 out of order, which has to do with safe ejection sites. Uh, Council, yes, Council Ballantyne, I see you. I get item 45 in there. Uh, are there any other requests to take items out of order? There are none before we get into that. We'll do citations and public hearings and then take these items out of order. Uh, next item, Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, item number four is a citation submitted by Councilor McLaughlin and the mayor commending Marvin Spitzer on the auspicious occasion of his 100th birthday. All right, Marvin is a World, uh, World I resident and World War II veteran. Uh, Councilor Ballantyne, I'm sure the entire council would like to sign on to this. Uh, World War II veteran, I won't speak too much because we'll be honoring him tomorrow, uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Mr. Spitzer and thank him for his service. This item will be laid on the table for approval. Uh, number five is a public hearing on a grand location application submitted by RCN to install 100 feet of conduit in Whipple Street connecting an existing utility pole to an existing manhole near 24 Whipple Street. All right, and now declare this public hearing open. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? There's a little hand icon you can use and press that button and I will call on you. Let's see, attendees. I don't see anyone here to speak on this item. Uh, if you are here to speak on this, please use the hand icon. Going up. Here we go, Bill Conway. Bill, you are muted on my side. Bill, are you there? Um, and to install 100 feet of conduit uh, from the utility pole to the manhole. Uh, this is kind of works with. Uh, Petition number six as well. Um, we need this to um, continue to provide service for the constituents of Somerville. 
All right. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? Please use the hand icon. Go once, go in twice. I now declare this poll. Oh, here we go. Alex Ortiz. Alex, you're unmuted on my side. Thank you. I'm Alex Ortiz. I work for RCN, Instruction Manager. Um, and okay. we are. Go ahead. Um, and we're petitioning for the both digs. Um, Okay, are you and Bill both petitioning for the same thing? Yes, we are together. Okay. Um, all right, anybody else in the audience who wishes to speak on this item, please use the hand icon. Go once, go on twice. I now declare, oh, and we have a third one. Or would it go? Nope, we don't. I now declare this public hearing closed. Any questions from the council, Councilor Davis? Yes, so, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so this is up in my ward near the um, the big Eversource building that RCN uses. And I just wanted to understand, I, the first gentleman that spoke was, was cutting out a little bit. So I wanted to, to just be clear on what the, um, essentially what, what the purpose of this is. Is it for a specific project or, or address or is it just general upgrade of the system? Hi, it's Alex Ortiz from RCN. Yes, uh, can you answer that question? Yes. Um, the reason being is the lease is not being um, renewed to RCN from the Eversource. Council Davis? Okay, so I, I'll try and fill in the blanks for what I thought was going to be the rest of that sentence. Um, so the, the RCN is, will no longer be using that building, and so this is, so okay, it, it, I guess I won't try. Please explain to me that, um, just, no objection, I just want to understand, because people are going to ask me, so I can understand, explain what, what's going on, what y'all are doing up there. No problem. Um, because the lease was not re-signed, um, we ran a new cable from Arlington into Somerville. So the customers in Somerville will be fed out of the Arlington office now. Okay, so is, is, this is effectively just routing the, the, the cable from um, from that, that new line coming from Arlington into the existing network bypassing the, the facility that, that's there now. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Okay, all right. Um, no further questions. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, I did see a Benny Klobosh on the audience uh, who raised their hand, so I'm going to reopen the public hearing and unmute you, Benny. Uh, Benny, are you there? Hi, yeah, uh, this is Benny Nalbach from 109 Willow Avenue. Uh, are, are we talking about six yet? Uh, I know the previous... We're not there. Previous well, we're technically not there yet. Uh, we're still on item five, but uh, if you okay. can wait a moment, uh, they are related. Yep, sounds good. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Would all right, I'm going to close this public hearing again. Uh, any questions, comments from the council? Councilor Davis, do you have a preference on this? Well, I think I'd, I'd like to lay this one on the table, Mr. President, uh, since we have a, a member of the public that wants to speak on the related item. I'd like to, you know, hear if you have any okay. concerns. All right, this item will be laid on the table. Uh, can you read the next item, Mr. Clark? Certainly. Item number six is a, is a public hearing on a grand location application centered by RCN to install 55 feet of conduit in Willow Ave, connecting an existing utility pole to an existing manhole near 109 Willow Ave. All right, and now to play this public hearing open, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? I have Alex and Bill, and um, unless you guys have something to say, I'll turn it over to Benny. I'm gonna recognize you, Benny, you have the floor. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, so we were just uh, wondering if there was a schedule of work known, uh, how, how long this is gonna take, and then if we could get a contact, um, because if you see there, the, the line runs in front of our driveway. Uh, so uh, we'll probably be our, yeah, blocked from being able to, to exit that driveway. So getting a contact for uh, who can talk to you about that? 
Okay. Uh, Bill or Alex, do you have a comment there? I do. Uh, my name is Alex Ortiz. Uh, do you have a pen? I could give you my contact number. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, it's 617-839-2864. Got it. Thanks. You're very welcome. And I'll be your contact for any questions or any issues that arise while this project is going on. Great. Do you know how long you're expecting it to take? Um, the dig should only take one day. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any further comment from the public? Please use the hand icon. Go on once. Going twice. I now declare this public hearing closed. Uh, Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. So just to quick follow up on that question from uh, from the constituents um, in that in the area there, is it to, to the the uh, representative from RCN? Is it the plan to? Or do you anticipate that folks' driveways will be blocked or, or that the street will be uh, closed off at any point during the day? Um. During the dig, we may need to block his driveway for a couple hours, um, but we'll have police details um, for the correct permits. Um, and like I said, he has my number. He's more than welcome to call me. If, if a certain day works better for him and his family, um, we would be more than welcome to make that work. Are there any other driveways that you anticipate needed to, to block for the work? I don't. I think it's just that one. But as long as you as you, you're all in, in, in uh, contact, um, you know my request would be that you obviously it goes without saying you know, provide uh, notice ahead of time so that they can plan accordingly, um, rather than calling you you know after they're blocked. Um, but uh, you know, and if any other any any expansion of the uh, the site is required, obviously to let folks know so they can plan ahead. I'll d we'll definitely do that. Um, I'll go out. Uh days before and, and let people know. Thank you. All right. Uh, do you have a motion to approve that, Councilor Davis? So moved. All right. Uh, if there's no further comments, these two items are laid on the table for approval. Item number seven is a public hearing and a grant location application submitted by Extinet to install 38 feet of conduit in Broadway from a manhole near Kennison Road to a proposed handhole, then continuing two feet to a small wireless facility at 274 Broadway. All right, and now I declare this public hearing open. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? Please use the hand icon. Rosanna. Rosanna, you are on mute. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Rosanna Ferranti on behalf of Extinet. And we're proposing to install 38 feet of conduit on Broadway from manhole 7502 near Kennison Road to a proposed handhole, then continuing two feet to a small wireless facility at 274 Broadway, which has been previously approved. All right, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? Please use the hand icon. Um, Ann Bates, did I see you raise your hand? Yep. Ann Bates, you have the floor. I have a question. Yes, my, office, my office is on that corner, and will somebody be coming out ahead of time to let us know what it involves, and will I be able to drive down the street and my employees drive down the street, Kennison? to our parking lot in the back of the building? Yeah, so we are happy to actually meet you out there anytime so we can talk through the project. Um, and looking at the plans, I believe you're at 272, correct? Correct, correct. Okay, and so I'm um, look as I look at the plans, I see that the dig is in front of 274. So I don't think we would interfere with you. Um, but I'm happy to have myself and the construction manager go out and meet, you know, on site. Anytime that's convenient with you, I will be glad to meet with you. Okay, I do have your contact information. I actually did already send this question over to 
um, our construction department. I just haven't received an answer back yet. But in, in reviewing the plans myself, I don't think there'd be an impact. But um, like I said, let's set up a time. I'll reach, I'll send you an email and we can uh, coordinate a site visit. And what is your name? My name is Rosanna Ferranti. F-E-R-A-N-T-E? -E. Uh, two R's, A-N-T-E. Okay. And how much time do you think it's going to take for the for the job? It shouldn't be more than a day. At okay, the most. that's great. Thank you very much, Rosanna. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who has a question? Please use or comment. Please use the hand icon. All right. Seeing no further comment, I now declare this public hearing closed. Any comments from the council? Uh, council Estrezzo? No comment. Thank you. All right. Council Davis? This one's down on the other end of the... Other end of the uh, I think that's old, Mr. Chair. Uh, my bad. Mr. President. All right. Uh, any further comment from the council? Seeing none, this item is laid on the table for approval. Next item. Item uh, number eight is a public hearing and a grant location application submitted by Extinet to install 34 feet of conduit in Broadway from a manhole near Langmaid Avenue to a proposed handhole, then continuing two more feet to a small wireless facility near 321 Broadway. All right, and now to declare this public hearing open. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? Rosanna. Yes, thank you. Rosanna Ferranti on behalf of Extinet. We have submitted this petition to install 34 feet of conduit on Broadway from manhole 1902 near Langmaid Avenue to a proposed handhole, then continuing two feet to a small wireless facility near 321 Broadway, which has been previously approved. All right. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? Please use the hand icon. Go once. Going twice. Seeing no further comment, I now declare this public hearing closed. Is there any comment from the council? Mr. President, um, both of these uh, operations seem pretty similar, but I would just ask uh, just uh, to get on the record. So to, to Ms. Um, Pereira, um, how long will this take? You said a day for the other, it's probably about the same as the other one? Yeah, these are very uh, short underground digs. So we'll work with DPW and we typically submit a traffic management plan with our permits. Okay, one thing I know that um, the folks feel really strongly about is uh, you would be, um, there is a bike lane right there. And uh, so I don't know where you're gonna be positioned on Broadway, uh, but there is a bike and bus lane um, right there. So I would ask that you, um, with respect to the bike and bus lane, um, make sure that there's at least the safety cones to go around the, uh, the work that's being done if you can't avoid uh, being in those lanes. Thank you. Okay, I'll make a note of that. Okay, thank you. All right, any further comment? Hearing no further comment, the sign was laid on the table for approval. Mr. President, we move then to item number 22, which is a communication Submitted by Council Ewan Campen, Davis, Scott, and Umba, updating this council on preparations for the first community meeting regarding civilian oversight on March 24th. Council Ewan Campen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So I have a few brief updates uh, tonight to share with the council and the public um, about our ongoing work with civilian oversight of police. And then I'd like to uh, briefly sponsor our outreach coordinator, Mr. Mason, to share a, a quick update about the out outwork Re, uh, the outreach work uh, that we are planning. So first, I'm, I'm very excited to share that we are, have scheduled our first town hall community meeting uh, for Wednesday, March 24th at 6.30 p.m., one month from yesterday. Um, we will be sharing much more logistical details over the coming week as we get materials translated, but we wanted to share the date and the time so that you can all pencil that into your schedules. Um, second, if you look at this agenda item, you'll see I've shared with the council and with the public a 20-page draft document that uh, was written by our legislative and policy analyst, Areem Desina. 
um, which is, it outlines a great deal of research that, that she has done on how civilian oversight works in communities across the country um, and, and within Massachusetts. So the, the report is still in draft form, but we wanted to share it with, with all of you at this early stage so that all of us can, um, can get on the same page on some of the background of the basic policy issues here. Um, and third and last, I'm glad to say that earlier this week on Monday, we were able to all get together um, with uh, folks from the mayor's office and from the solicitor's office to get Ms. Decina um, connected with our solicitor's office and start working on some draft legislation um, that, of course, we will adapt um, as we um, start to gather community input and to get Mason in touch with our legislative liaisons um, uh, uh, to, to help work through the kind of technical and logistical issues that arise with putting together these meetings. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to sponsor our outreach coordinator, uh, Mason, to give a brief update on the work that he has been doing leading up to the beginning of our, our formal public-facing outreach. All right, Council Ian Camden, I would like to sponsor a speaker, seeing no objection. Uh, Mason, you're unmuted on my side. Thank you so much. Um, I believe there is a, on page 19 of the document, if, it, if we're able to pull that up, I'll be able to um, share or provide some context of what I've worked on so far. But while we wait for that, um, how we got to the March 24th, 2011 virtual town hall was in part of what I call counselor consultations. Um, so far I've had them with counselor Umba, Ewan Campen, Davis, Strezzo, Neither Gang, Valentine, and Councillor Scott, um, with the objective to have them help me um, interact with 2,000 Somerville residents um, to participate in this conversation of civilian oversight of the Somerville Police Department and the legislation that comes with it. So far in this process, I'm realizing and understanding that it's much deeper than solely civilian oversight. So what I have proposed to the council as um, terms of community input in um, engaging Somerville are just a list of um, outreach efforts that I'd like to present to you all so far that are kind that are still in the works, but these are just some things I've I've started so far. So as this um, page expresses here, we have the virtual town hall meetings um, where uh, the presentation by our legislative and policy analysts will be available um, based off an informational survey that will be available in multiple languages. Um, we are currently working with um, the Director of Intercommunicative Affairs at the Mayor's Office um, to get the coordinating logistics to make sure that this survey can be available in every language that we have available to represent the many cultures within Somerville. Um, with the assistance of the counselors I've contacted so far, um, I've been able to assemble what I call ward warriors, which is pretty much leaders within your respective wards that I could start to engage um, conversations around civilian oversight to pretty much um, use their influence as community leaders to bring in their audiences and their followings or their churches and congregations, um, members to their community organizations, whatever it is. Um, the counselors that I've engaged with so far have identified these board warriors for us to follow up with to prepare them for our virtual town hall meeting. Recognizing that um, the virtual town hall might be a little intimidating um, for some folks what I'm also interested in presenting to the council are these Brave Space Conversations series. So it's an opportunity that I would like to be extremely language specific. Um, so you'd have entire conversations in Spanish, Cape Verdean Creole, Haitian Creole, Nepali, Vietnamese, whatever um, languages that we, we could assemble for these Brave Space Conversations series. Because what I'm learning in this process so far, which I appreciate that the council is willing to be innovative in this legislative process is to try to be as inclusive and equitable. And in the quest for equity, access and education is um, a barrier for many Somerville residents. So encouraging the city council to participate in these brave space conversation series with different facets of the Somerville um, community will add um, to the data we're looking to collect from our informational surveys for Somerville residents to potentially engage and participate in our two virtual town halls. The first being scheduled for March 21st at 6.30 p.m. Are there any questions? <laughs> All right, any uh, questions or comments from the council? I see Councilor Strezzo. 
Okay, so uh, this uh, it says, uh, Mason, you said March 24th. This is uh, 21st. This says March 24th. Is it March 24th or is it March 21st? I apologize. It is March 24th. Okay. And can you describe what the Brave Space conversation is, uh, what, what the uh, objectives and goals of the uh, Brave Space conversation series is on this specific one? Absolutely. So I recognize just through um, my conversations with the Ward Warriors as selected by the various um, uh, recommendations from the counselors and the city council that there are varying opinions and knowledge around just civilian oversight and what that means, even down to what uh, defund means. So the objective of these brave space conversations is an opportunity for the city to engage with the Somerville residents in hearing with an open heart and open mind the stories and experiences of some of the residents so it can help influence the legislation that we create as a council um, for civilian oversight. So some of these conversations, um, well, technically, brave space conversation in and of itself requires a level of intentionality uh, because I realized that we are typically engaged in safe space conversations. But what's safe for me is not what's safe for you, which is why we are on the quest for civilian oversight today, um, just as a general context of the difference between the safe space and the brave space. Brave space is meaning we are going to sit in our discomfort and really hear what has to say um, in order to make equity a sure center and focal point of all work and legislation that comes as a result of so much civilian mistrust of both the Somerville Police Department and the City Council. Any further questions or comments? Councilor Ballantyne. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I just want to say that um, I am really impressed with how quickly Areem and Mason have um, gathered so much information in a short period of time. And, I, you know, I, I love the idea, and I will say it's a, it's a, uh, it's a new term for me, but this brave space uh, conversation series. Um, so I uh, appreciate all the work that's going into this, and... Uh, I know everybody's heard my concerns that, uh, which is always about being as inclusive as possible. So I certainly feel that the outline is making every attempt to do that. And I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Mason, and thank you, Irene. Thank you, Councillor Valentine. All right, any further questions or comments? There are no further comments. This item is laid on the table and placed on file. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Mr. President, we move to item number 45, which is an order submitted by Councilor Ballantyne that the Director of Health and Human Services use the attached tool to help small businesses and schools adapt to the evolving science around COVID-19 by sharing current data, identifying risks, and defining contingencies. Councilor Ballantyne. Thank you, Mr. President. So um, currently the city of Somerville has been providing residents with data on the city website. Uh, the data only looks back in time. It tells us what happened. Um, today it's um, nearly a year when the mayor issued his declaration of emergency for the city. Uh, we need information uh, for our small businesses and our schools on how to deal with the future. We need a tool like the one in this order, which helps everyone anticipate how our city will act going forward. This tool complements the order that I submitted to the council uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I worked on this tool with a uh, Somerville resident, Professor uh, Danielle Latanya, she's an associate professor of environmental health in the School of Engineering at Tufts University. She's a former CDC employee and advisor to 
the World Health Organization, and a specialist in the prevention of transmission of infectious diseases. I'd like to sponsor her to speak uh, on this order, um, Mr. President. Councilor Ballantyne, I'd like to support Danielle Latanya to speak. I uh, see no objection. Uh, Danielle, I have unmuted you. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for hosting me tonight, and thank you, Councillor Valentine, for pushing this forward. Um, I, Councillor Valentine has asked me to speak about seven minutes on a shortened version of a presentation I presented to the Chamber of Commerce um, at the invitation of Adam Portney um, and the, the head of the Chamber of Commerce last week. So I'm going to just build to, to where this order has come from. So when an emergent, when an infectious disease emerges into the human population, one of the first things we want to know is how it's transmitted, because then we can help um, prevent that transmission. And that's, that emerges over time. We don't know that on day one, but over the past year of, of emerging science on COVID, we have learned that COVID um, is primarily spread by droplets, these are large particles that fall from the mouth and nose quickly and are um, and generally are when you sneeze or cough or when you're projecting such as as, um, as singing or having a very large projecting voice. Now with large droplets, we prevent transmission with masks and with distancing. Now COVID is also what's termed by World Health opportunistically aerosol. And aerosols are these very small particles that stay in the air for a long time. They can float more. Um, and the opportunistically aerosol transmission is some of the, the super spreader events we've heard about, the, the choirs where you're singing in a basement room and, and you, may have, um, you may have a lot more aerosols in the air and you'll get this, these kind of super spreading events. Um, the general consensus right now is about 90% of COVID transmission is droplets and 10% is aerosols. Now, COVID is not spread by touching surfaces. Um, at the beginning, we, you might all remember washing your groceries or disinfecting your groceries or, or all those recommendations. But we now know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID doesn't, doesn't live on surfaces, although hand washing is still important to prevent transmission um, via the eyes. And, and also um, hand washing and surface disinfection can be important to prevent transmission of other diseases that might be confounded with COVID or might um, make someone worry they have COVID and need a test or need medical care that might be better served to provide to someone who does have COVID. Now we also know that there are populations more at risk of COVID. In particular, older populations are more at risk and the youngest are at least risk. Um, we can ask the question, why are the youngest least at risk and why are the oldest most at risk? And it's a host of factors for that. It has to do with the immune system, previous vaccinations, triggering and development of the immune systems, vitamin D, the presence of ACE2 receptors in the nose. There's a whole set of reasons, but in the end, our children less than 12, our children roughly before puberty, are least at risk and risk goes up with age exponentially, um, especially in our populations over 65. We also know that there's co if you have comorbidities, you're more at risk, um, obesity, diseases, et cetera. And in Somerville in particular, we know that those more at risk of COVID are in our communities of color. And so when you think about how the disease is transmitted and who is at risk, you can think about mitigation measures for certain activities. I'll also um, do a bit of introduction to vaccines. Um, over the past year, we've done an amazing job rolling out vaccines. We have two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, both of which are 95% efficacious at reducing um, uh, severe disease after the second dose, 14 days after the second dose. We also have brand new emerging data from a couple days ago that um, the Pfizer vaccine is um, effective at reducing transmission when you are asymptomatic. So it also re uh, reduces asymptomatic disease. Um, there's another vaccine, AstraZeneca. Now this is um, 
was approved, but it unfortunately is not working well against one variant of COVID, which I'll talk about next. So there's questions about how widely it will be rolled out. And again, with emerging science in the last days, Johnson & Johnson has been approved or will be in certain countries, and that, um, that vaccine will come online. The mRNA vaccines are the most effect efficacious and also the easiest to provide a booster with as new variants develop. So we do have a, a host of vaccines. Um, I will note very importantly that the vaccines are not approved for children yet less than 16 to 18 years of age. The trials are ongoing right now for teenagers, the 12 to 16 to 18 year olds. Those results for Pfizer are expected to come out early in April. So our teenagers may be able to be vaccinated or go on, on the list soon. We don't know the results yet, but the testing has not yet begun in children under 12. Um, my son is registered for that trial and I just got a letter um, yesterday that that trial will begin in Boston at the beginning of April. Um, so there is a rollout plan for vaccines in Massachusetts that I'm sure you're all aware of that um, does provide vaccination um, first to those considered most at risk and then moving down the line. Um, I'm in general population, so I've got a ways to go, but we're getting there. Do you want to talk about new variants? SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, has the entire human population as its Petri dish right now. It is mutating very quickly. There are variants of concern reported to World Health Organization every day. Um, right now, there are three variants of concern um, that the orig originally um, from the UK, South Africa, and Brazil that are considered um, variants of concern because they are all 50% more infectious than the original SARS-CoV-2. There are about 10 variants of concern that are being evaluated for their, there are 10 variants that are considered potential variants of concern that are being evaluated as to whether they'll go on this list. Additionally, the, there's initial data that I, is not yet confirmed that the UK variant may also be more deadly. That's not, we can't say that for sure yet. There's also initial data, and this is probably more sure that the Brazil variant will reinfect you if you had original COVID, you can be reinfected with the Brazil one. One of these variants will win in Massachusetts. Um, one will, will win the evolutionary race. And those variants are expected to be dominant in Massachusetts, according to the modeling, sometime around the end of March, beginning of April. One thing I want to really highlight with the new variants is currently all the new variants transmit the same way. Primarily droplet, a little bit of aerosol, not on surfaces. That means the mitigation measures are the same, but you have less room for error in the mitigation measures. You can't take that mask off at all. And there's also a lot of um, kind of emerging and, and the science isn't quite clear yet recommendations to maybe do a bit better with your masking. Maybe that crappy cloth mask isn't as good and maybe we should talk about a medical mask or, a, or in certain situations, a KN95. Um, new variants will come the human population is a petri dish, and even though the U.S. population may be widely vaccinated by the fall, um, the rest of the world will not be, and this um, disease is spreading and mutating throughout the rest of the world as well, which could potentially impact, will impact the United States. So when we think about businesses, the recommended protections really depend on your business, and this is what I talked to the Chamber of Commerce about. Um, and it also is, is very different. It's much easier to open an outdoor zoo where you're outside, you can mask and distance and do a one-way walkway as you walk with your kids and look at the animals. It's much harder to open a nightclub where you're indoors without the airflow, um, you're drinking and dancing and loudly talking right next to people, right? And so what you'd want to think with businesses is to develop a plan for opening that kind of is on these basic tenets of masking and distancing and airflow, but that is appropriate for your business type. And you've probably heard in the last day or so about the gym study where there were super spreader events in gyms. 
And I want to highlight that those results, when you think about it in this framework I'm presenting, those results do not say close all gyms. They had super spreader events in classes that were held indoors in small rooms where people were having physical exertion with inconsistent masking, right? That's probably something you're not masking. You're probably pretty poorly distanced. You might not have great airflow and you're having this physical exertion that might be an aerosolizing opportunistic event. You might wanna consider closing stuff like that, those, those kind of group exertion activities in small rooms, but maybe having those treadmills that are eight feet apart where individuals are on them is not a problem. And so this is about thinking about how transmission happens and how you can safely open and what you can't open based on transmission patterns. Um, there's been a lot of talk about schools and, I've, and schools is the other thing the Chamber of Commerce asked me to speak about. And we are very lucky with this disease as a parent of young children. I'm very um, happy about this, that the children under 12, our elementary school children, are less likely than everyone else to have COVID with symptoms, less likely to have asymptomatic symptoms, less likely to transmit. They're not drivers of the epidemic, but they, that doesn't mean they can't to transmit. But our older children, our, our children past puberty, our, our middle school and high school kids, are actually less likely to have symptomatic COVID, but more likely to have asymptomatic COVID. And when you add those two numbers together, they have the same rate of disease as the 20 year olds, the 20 to 30 year olds, and they can transmit COVID and they can drive the spread of disease. So you need to treat those older ones like adults in the term of the precautions you take. And so when you think about schools, you may do different things with the little ones or your preschoolers than you're doing with your big ones. You might need to distance your big ones more than your little ones, right? And as a, as a um, woman with six grandparents over the age of 75 in my family, well, I'm grateful that my little ones are not as impacted by COVID. I'm, I'm very worried about the grandparents. So, so there is an age dependency here. Um, Somerville has um, a top 1% safety plan for teachers and students in the nation, as I'm sure you've heard in the last few days. Um, there's an agreement with the, between the union um, school committee and um, city to start bringing back safely, starting with the little ones, into the schools with distancing, testing, ventilation improvements, masking, all of these things. And actually the plan right now because of partly around the transmission is to leave the big ones, the high school students in remote learning. And this is again, thinking about this from a transmission perspective. So I'll end by saying, there's a lot of emerging research on COVID and the data changes day to day, but we know the current underlining framework of how transmission happens and the mitigations we can take to prevent them. And generally there's an emerging consensus that schools should be first to open then you open businesses after the easy to open businesses first, then the harder to open. Following the transmission that's happening, you close things if transmission goes up and then schools should be last to close, right? So you're following the outbreak. Um, I was asked to speak by the Chamber of Commerce and Councillor Ballantyne saw that presentation and asked me to come here. And part of what came out at the Chamber of Commerce is there's a lot of questions in the Somerville community from parents and businesses about why. Why is this allowed to open? Why is this not allowed to open? Why is this happening? Why not? And from the parent and business community, it seems like things are made very opaquely. And there's a need for transparency. COVID is not going to go away. We need to respond to the emergency emerging science and, um, and so as that, I worked with Councillor Ballantyne to have a framework free opening on decision making based on transmission decisions to understand why decisions are being made and how we can move in the future with the outbreak. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right, do we have any questions or comments from the council? All right, hearing no comments. Uh, thank you very much for Councillor Ballantyne. Um, so what I would ask, uh, and I, I thank my colleagues um, for uh, allowing this presentation, I would ask that um, this item be referred to public health, public safety, 
And uh, if it's possible, if the chair could uh, include this on Monday's meeting uh, so we could hear a reaction from the administration. Thank you. Very good. Any uh, further comments? Not, thank you very much for attending. Uh, this item will be laid on the table for approval and referred to public health and safety. Uh, now, before we move on, uh, Councilor Rossetti wants to clarify the order of her items. Uh, we're going to take item 33, 31, 29, and 32 in that order. So let's start with item number 33. Mr. President, item number 33 is a report of the Committee on Confirmation of Appointments, which met on February 18th. Councilor Rossetti. You're muted. I always forget that down button. Thank you, sir. Uh, the, the committee members were all in attendance with the exception of Councillor Scott as he had an obligation to the planning board that evening for development in his ward. Uh, we also had joining us uh, Chief Breen, uh, Assistant Chief Major, Ms. Ellen Collins, the Assistant Director in our HR department, and Ms. Kushbu Weber. I am pleased to announce, sir, um, and I believe we have um, these um, members of our Proud Fire Department present with us here this evening. We had six uh, people before us this evening for promotions within the department, and you will see that the report shows favorably for all six, and I would like to highlight uh, some, some of what we learned in meeting and in, in speaking with these candidates this evening. First, we had uh, Michael Anzalone, who was applying to become de Deputy Fire Chief, which would be the third in line in command. He is currently serving as captain in the department. He was lieutenant from 2006 to 2012, and he's in his 27th year here in the Somerville uh, Fire Department when he began in 1994. Uh, we learned a lot about him. We had a lot of um, serious dialogue. We also learned that um, he, one of his skills, his strengths, is grant writing and development. And uh, he, he let us know some of the successes in that role. Uh, he was a member who helped to rebuild that new firefighter, beautiful firefighter memorial on Somerville Avenue that I know we all were in attendance for at that, that opening and dedication. Um, he also was one of the... Um, officers and firefighters recently commended by this city council for his actions involved with the Kensington Street fire um, in December. So we were proud and unanimously um, accepted the recommendation for his promotion to deputy fire chief. Next, we had Stephen Morris, um, who was applying to become district fire chief. He currently, he's in his 21st year here in the department, currently serving as captain but beginning in 2014. He was a lieutenant in 2010 up to 2014 and began his service in 2000. Some of the highlights um, of uh, currently Captain Morris is that he um, is a certified peer fitness trainer and we had dialogue about how he could bring that um, knowledge to the department. He's also one of two members of the department who attended um, extensive workshops out in uh, Texas where he is now a specialist in urban search and rescue. Uh, he, we had great conversation about that and what he's doing here in Somerville in um, sharing what he learned and educating the department, members of our department in that regard. Next, we um, interviewed Patrick Calloran, currently uh, serving as Lieutenant, applying to become Captain. He's in his 11th year here in the department. He um, prior served in the U.S. Army as a captain commander. Uh, the week of the interview, he let us know that he had just finished um, his master's, his recipient of a master's in emergency management. We had really good dialogue with now uh, Captain, now, excuse me, now Lieutenant Halloran and unanimously also accepted the request for him to become captain. Next, we interviewed Lieutenant Derek Nolan, who was applying to become captain within the department. Lieutenant Nolan is serving in his 14th year currently for the department. Prior um, 
prior to becoming a firefighter, he was a correction officer in the Middlesex Sheriff's Office. The report is more detailed of our interview with this candidate, but again, the committee unanimously moved to accept the recommendation of his promotion. Next, we interviewed um, Acting Lieutenant James Pawinski, who was before us applying to become a lieutenant. He is serving in his 27th year here in our department. We learned that he was a graduate of Somerville Tech Trade High School. And um, for 12 years, he was the fire department's coordinator for muscular dystrophy. And we know all the work um, that's involved in the wonderful um, good that the fire departments do for um, families with muscular dystrophy. So we had serious um, interviews with um, Lieutenant, Acting Lieutenant Polinski, and following those interviews, there was a unanimous vote to accept uh, the recommendation of him becoming a lieutenant. Last but not least, we interviewed Paul Marrera, uh, currently serving in his capacity as Acting Lieutenant, but applying to become a lieutenant before us at this meeting. He is currently in his 13th year here in the department. Um, he is certified in, uh, in ice water rescue. And he's, we asked, um, what is, I asked what any further aspirations he had, and he's aspiring to further his career, be, becoming a rank of captain. So I won't be surprised if we don't see uh, Lieutenant Marrera coming before us in the near future as well. Um, he also unanimously um, voted and, and approved to accept the recommendation of becoming lieutenant within the department. Mr. President and my colleagues, I asked for the report to be submitted as presented, and there are um, the members here this evening. I don't know if any of them wishes to address the council or not, Mr. President, but um, if they do, if they could raise their hands and if we could um, honor them, they may uh, not, <laughs> may be shy and not wish to speak. It's, I explained to them the difficulty of doing this. Congratulations in a virtual world. We much would rather be in chambers and shaking um, their hands personally and congratulating their families, but given COVID in today's world, this is how we do these right now. So, uh, Mr. President, thank you. All right, Councilor Rosetti moves to accept the committee report as submitted. Uh, and if there are any firefighters who would like to speak, uh, I see Michael Anzalone would like to speak. Uh, Councilor Rosetti would like to sponsor Michael Anzalone. Uh, Michael, you're unmuted on my side. You there, Michael? You might have to unmute on your side. There you go. Thank you, the committee. Thank you, uh, Council Rosetti and all the council members. I appreciate the um, recommendation and approval of um, the appointment. Also, thank you to the mayor's office. I would like to thank my family who put up with a lot. Uh, there's a lot goes into studying over the years, and uh, I've been studying for a long time, so they put up with a lot from me and my girl, my three daughters and my wife. Uh, and one other mention I would like, I would like to mention uh, my mother who, and my mother's husband who are in South Carolina living. And if we had an, in, in the chamber event, retired some of a fire alarm operator uh, for over 10 years. And my stepfather, Ed Callahan, retired Boston fire captain, both of whom I believe would have pinned my badge on me when they got here. So um, I would just like to, I know they're on. So hi, Ma. And I would just like to thank them very much. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I do wish you, uh, we all had you in the audience, but I'm sure a lot of you uh, would much rather be in the comfort of your own home too. So. Uh, thank you very much for your service. Uh, do we have any comments or questions from the council? All right, why don't we uh, take this off the table. Let's do a roll call vote on this item. Mr. President, this is a roll call vote on the approval of agenda item 33, which includes the appointments or the promotions of the uh, firefighters listed. On the approval of the committee report, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. 
Councillor Ewan Kempen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Rumba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 councillors have voted in favor. Uh, that item has been approved. All right. Uh, so for the next few items, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, for the next few items, I have to recuse myself due to a personal conflict, conflict of interest. Uh, Councilor Rossetti will take over as president, and uh, please someone send me an update when I can return. Councilor Rossetti. I'll have someone send you a text when you can return, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Clerk, could you please call on item 31, please? Madam President, item 31 is a report of the Committee on Confirmation of Appointments and Personnel Matters, which met on February 2nd. So, colleagues, uh, the entire committee was present that evening. Also joining us was Chief Femino uh, of the, of the uh, excuse me, the Police Department, Deputy Chief James Stanford, Deputy Chief Chris Ward, Ellen Collins of the Personnel Department, Frank Wright, the City Solicitor from the Law Department, Kushbu Webb, the Director of Governmental Affairs, Lauren Rankin-Yellow, Legislative Liaison, and our clerks that evening were Kim Wells and Peter Forsalise. Um, I reviewed with the committee the number of openings in the Somerville Police Department to date and spoke about the recent and upcoming retirements within that department and the committee's plan for interviewing candidates for those um, opened positions. Councilor Scott spoke about bypass information. Um, there is an extremely detailed report online and has been posted um, for the review of yourselves, colleagues, and the public. Um, also spoke about, uh, Councilor Scott, Scott also addressed the Boston Civil Service case. I asked Councilor Scott to submit a motion for how he would like the bypass notification withdrawals process to work in the future for the city side. Um, Councilor Scott spoke about the O'Donnell decision and the committee's efforts to review other documents. There were multiple documents attached and are attached to this report. Um, I said that all candidates, I reminded the committee that all candidates, as we proceeded into interviews, all candidates should be asked the same question, and that is how I had planned to proceed for the evening. I also referenced a mayor, um, excuse me, a memo that we had received from the mayor about a half hour before the meeting that evening. Um, Councillor Scott stated that he appreciated that for the first time in over three years of requesting modifications to the reserve policy, and two years after the City Council passed a resolution urging the mayor to stop using a reserve list, that this matter has been addressed, and that was um, sent to the entire council from his honor, the mayor. So the committee did hear um, item 210577, requesting the confirmation of the appointment of Matthew Fairchild to the position of reserve police officer. Following uh, discussion with that candidate, uh, there was a motion not to approve by a vote of 5-0. Then took up item 210571, requesting the confirmation of the appointment of Giovanna Lorenzette Marin to the position of reserve police officer. Following um, questioning of that candidate, there was a motion to approve, and that motion was uh, three in favor, Rosetti, Klingen, Strezzo, two against Scott Maba. That motion carried. Next item, 210573, requesting the confirmation of the appointment of Jose de Costa to the position of reserve police officer. Again, extensive interview of the candidate. Following completion of the interview, which is noted in the report online, it was a motion to accept um, and approve, which had Rossetti, Klingen, and Strezzo, yes. Two nays, Scott Maba, the motion carried, approval three to two. Um, I ask then that this report be accepted as presented this evening. Mr. Clerk. This is a roll call vote on the acceptance of the committee report just presented. On acceptance of the report, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. 
Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. I'm sorry, was that yes, Councillor Davis? Yes. Got it. Councillor Strezzo? Yes. Councillor Klingen? Yes. Councillor Mba? Yes. Councillor Scott? Yes. Councillor Rossetti? Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin? I don't record a vote for Councillor McLaughlin. He's recused. I have 10 councils who voted in favor of that item. One is recused. That item has been approved. Mr. Clerk, thank you. Now we take up please item 29. Item number 29 is an order submitted by Councillor Rossetti. In her capacity as chair of the Committee on Confirmation of Appointments and Personnel Matters, calling on this council to meet in executive session as necessary to address the adoption of the committee's report that just adopted or strategy with respect to potential litigation therefom. Uh, colleagues, we also have, if those of you who are not speaking, please mute yourselves, I'd appreciate that. We also have in attendance this evening, Councillor Tim Zussin of KP Law, which this council um, at our last city council meeting contracted with outside council at the request of solicitor Right. So we have Council Zussin here. Um, Mr. Clerk, I do not have the ability to unmute him. I'm not an organizer on this particular meeting. Would you or one of our other clerks please be able to unmute Attorney Zussin? It's Tim Zussin. He's the last name on the list. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, Tim Zussin here. Um, Councilor, can you assure that this is a matter to move into executive session? Yes, Madam. Um, it's, it's my opinion that this matter is appropriate to go into executive session on uh, to prepare for potential litigation and secondly to um, discuss ongoing litigation and, and prevent a, uh, a discussion of, of litigation strategy in open session. Colleagues, are there any questions on the motion to enter into executive session? Hearing none, Mr. Clerk, could you call the roll for executive session? This is a roll call vote on moving to executive session uh, for the purposes of discussing potential litigation and ongoing litigation. <laughs> on that item, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Mba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin. I record Councillor McLaughlin is recused. Madam President, 10 councillors have voted in favor. One is recused. The motion has been approved. And let me just say that all councillors have been sent a link. If anyone needs a link, please send me an email and I will resend the link. Thank you, Mr. Clark. So uh, for the community, um, it's understanding this meeting of the city council will now stand in recess. We will reconvene in public session following uh, the completion of the executive session. This meeting is in recess.
John, you want, want the screen? John. Yes, sir. You ready for the screen? No, uh, 930, please. All right, well, you can take it when you're ready for it, right? Yeah, thanks. All right, I'll just leave this up.
Mr. Clark, are you ready? Ready to go. Thank you, sir. I'd like to call this meeting of the City Council back to order. Uh, Mr. Clerk, could you please call the roll to establish a quorum? This is roll call to determine the presence of a quorum after the conclusion of the executive session. Councillor Niedergang. Here. Councillor White. Here. Councillor Ballantyne. Councillor Ballantyne. I do, I do not record Councillor Ballantyne as being present. Councillor Ewan Campen. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Strezzo. Present. Councillor Klingen. Present. Councillor Mba. Councillor Mba. Present. Councillor Scott. Present. Councillor Rossetti. Present. And I record Councillor McLaughlin still recused. Madam President, we have nine councillors present. One is, uh, one is recused, one is absent. We have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, I will say that um, there were no votes taken in the executive session other than the vote to adjourn. I now recognize Councillor Scott. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'd like to make a motion. It's been reduced in writing and uh, referred to the clerks. The motion is that this council authorizes Councilor Rossetti in her capacity as acting president of the city council and chair of the confirmation of appointments and personnel matters committee to send a bypass letter to Matthew Fairchild with assistance from attorney Zessen in his capacity as, act, as acting as outside counsel to the city council. On the motion, any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Clerk, could you call the roll? This is a roll call on Councillor Scott's uh, motion. Councillor Niedergang? Yes. Councillor White? Yes, and a very well phrased motion. Councillor Ballantyne? Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Strezzo? Yes. Councillor Klingen? Yes. Councillor Mba? Yes. Councillor Scott? Yes. Councillor Rossetti? Yes. Councillor McLaughlin? I record Councillor McLaughlin is recused. Madam President, 10 councillors voted in favor. One is recused. That motion has been approved. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Continuing on in the uh, previously mentioned items to be taken out of order, could we now take up item 32, please? Item 32 is a report of the Committee on Confirmation of Appointments and Personnel Matters meeting on February 16th. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. All members were present, all members assigned to the committee were present that evening. Also joining us was Attorney Tim Zessen, uh, outside counsel. Our clerks for the evening were Kim Wells and Peter Vosalis. We had two items on the agenda that evening. First, to review executive session minutes of the meeting of February 2nd, 2021. And the second was to confer with outside counsel regarding Somerville Police Department reserve officer candidate considered at meeting of February 2nd, 2021. Uh, no further business before the council, the committee uh, adjourned at 7.41 p.m. I submit the I ask for the report to be accepted as submitted. Any discussion on the report? Hearing none, um, given that um, one of our colleagues is recusing himself from these items, Mr. Clerk, could you call the roll on the report of uh, February 16, please? Here's a roll call vote on the approval of the committee report of February 16th. On that motion, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Councillor Ballantyne? Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Strezzo? Yes. Councillor Klingen? 
Yes. Councillor Umba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. I record Councillor McLaughlin is recused. Madam President, 10 councillors have voted in favor of approval. One is recused. That item has been approved. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Could you please continue it back to the regular order of business? Madam President, I believe that continuing to uh, the last item, I believe, out of order will bring us to item number 42, which is a communication submitted by the city solicitor requesting approval to retain the pro bono services of Todd and Weld as outside counsel to advise the city with respect to the establishment of safe consumption sites. Okay, I'm back everybody. And unfortunately, it all took so long that our pro bono lawyer could not stick around. Uh, so I am going to lay this out. I'm going to refer this item to the uh, finance committee. Very good. That brings returns us to the regular order of business. Is that correct? Uh, Councilor Scott, you had an item you wanted to take out of order, correct? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, although uh, I seem to have lost it in my tabs here, uh, it was the item for which uh, Assistant Solicitor Shapiro is with us this evening. Um, oh, regarding uh, the release of executive session minutes that's been requested. Item number 41. Uh, Count, uh, Mr. Clerk, could you please read? I take item number 41 out of order and read it. Item 41 is a communication submitted by the city clerk conveying a request to release the minutes of this council's January 14, 2021 executive session regarding item number 211-181, which is a request to the mayor to appear in executive session to discuss public safety and security matters. Both this council may enter into an executive session to consider this request. All right, uh, we have the councilor uh, Solicitor Shapiro here uh, to discuss this. Uh, Mr. Solicitor, is this an item that you think is necessary for executive session? Yes. All right, do any councilors have any questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll and we'll go into executive session again. This is a roll call vote to move to executive session pursuant to item 41 to consider uh, consider the release of minutes that were uh, taken of an executive session. On that motion, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Mba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 councillors voted in favor of that motion um, to move to executive session. Okay, we'll see you all in executive session, Councillor. Yeah, um, just a long send me the, um, send me the invite. I, I can't seem to find the executive session invite. Can you do? And one sec, that is, I want to make sure I understand that is, uh, Councillor Shapiro, I will send you that uh, link shortly, just two minutes. Thank right, you. I'm sure everyone has the right link, too. All right, see you in executive session.
out of executive session. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll to establish a quorum. One, se one second, Mr. President. All right, uh, thank you for that moment. This is a roll call to determine the presence of a quorum following the uh, second executive session of the evening. Councillor Niedergang. Here. Councillor White. Here. Councillor Ballantyne. Present. Councillor Ewan Kempen. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Strezzo. Here. Councillor Klingen. Present. Councillor Mba. Councillor Mba. I'm here. Councillor Scott. Present. Councillor Rossetti. Present, if you can hear me, I, my computer just froze. I'm present. We got it. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 councilors have made it back. We have a quorum. Okay. We have returned from executive session. The city council took a vote to approve the minutes of the executive session for release to the public. Those minutes and another vote will be available at the next city council meeting. Um, now it's back to business. The time now is 1030. So everyone, please be wary of the time because we're basically starting the meeting right now. Um, are we all done with items out of order, Mr. Clerk? We might, I think we're back to the regular order. I believe we are returning to the regular order of business, Mr. President. All right, back to the beginning. Mr. President, that brings us to item number nine which is an order submitted by Councilor Ballantyne, the Director of Health and Human Services, Shape Up Somerville, and the Somerville Food Security Coalition update and prepare recommendations for this council regarding access to food resources for anyone who needs help. Councilor Ballantyne. Thank you. I think the order is pretty self-explanatory. I would just ask that it be referred to. Oh, we cut you off at that last point. Where do you want to refer? I'm, um, I'm sorry, uh, to public health, public safety. All right, seeing no discussion, the item is laid on the table for approval and referred to public health and safety. Um, Mr. President, I would waive the reading of number 10 and ask that it be referred to public utilities, um, public works. And the next item, if Mr. Clerk could scroll up. I would also waive the reading of that and refer that to traffic and parking. All right, and oh, go ahead. Well, let's do one at a time because I'm getting confused. Uh, <laughs> the first item is uh, laid on the table for approval, refer to public utilities, public works. The uh, order 11 is uh, laid on the table for approval and referred to public health and safety. Next um, item. I'm sorry, 11 is to traffic and parking, please. 11 to traffic and parking, thank you. Okay. And um, in item uh, number 12, we could waive the reading. I would just ask for approval. Okay, Council Ballantyne moves to waive the readings. Uh, the re reading for item 12 is laid on the table for approval. And then items uh, 13 and 14, I would ask the, uh, to waive the readings and refer those to housing and community development. Council Ballantyne moves to waive the readings of items number 13 and 14, lay them on the table for approval and refer them to housing community development. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Next item. That brings us all the way up to item number 15, which is a resolution submitted by Councillor Strezzo and Councillor Ballantyne calling for a better future for Somerville's female workforce in 2021 and beyond. Councillor Strezzo. Thank you, Mr. President. And I do recognize that it is 1030, but 
I have been waiting for many, many hours to take this up. So therefore I have asked the clerk to read some of this resolution, not in its entirety, but a lot of the very driven points. This is an, because honestly it speaks for itself. We have a crisis and um, clerk, John Long, please, I ask if you don't mind reading it. Mr. Clark, could you please read the resolution? This is an abridged reading. Whereas the 2020 to 2021 COVID-19 pandemic shutdown in the United States has disproportionately disenfranchised women in the workplace, prompting a loss of over three decades worth of employment progress in less than a year, as reported by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and directly affects the lives and economic progress of Somerville women, and whereas the COVID-19 pandemic shutdown forced schools to switch to remote online learning only, the U.S. Census Bureau found that women have reported cutting back hours or stepping back from their jobs entirely at a rate three times more frequently than their male counterparts. And whereas in 2020, during the shutdown of schools, the U.S. Census Bureau reported that women ages 25 to 44 cited child care demands as their main, as their reason for not being able to work almost three times as often as men. And whereas women in the United States accounted for 100% of the job loss claims in the United States in December 2020, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, with black, Asian, and Latina women accounting for all the jobs lost that month. And whereas, according to the May 2020 uh, Somerville Community Data Profile, 50% of Somerville's population are women, 18% have, of Somerville families have a female head of household with no husband present, 28% of female householders with no husband present are living below the poverty line, and, sorry, wait for it. Unpartnered mothers. And unpartnered mothers bore the biggest drop in work share than any other group of parents in 2020-2021. And whereas the post-COVID-19 pandemic recovery in the United States begins, it is unacceptable that women of all colors, creeds, and immigration status in the United States and in Somerville should be subjected to return to the unpaid, under, unpaid, underpaid, unsupported labor market with an adequate workforce support present, such as before and during the COVID shutdown. And whereas the failure to respond to this employment crisis facing women will undo decades of female progress, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Somerville City Council calls on the mayor to declare a state of emergency facing Somerville women in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic shutdown job loss and the economic progress of the women of Somerville, and be it further resolved that this council asserts that Somerville must do its part to ensure that the former working considerations and the systemic discounting of women's contributions to society be eliminated and rebuilt entirely and supported in every possible way, including making available all possible municipal support to elevate the status of all Somerville women to exist in equity with their male and non-binary counterparts. And Mr. President, there are two more uh, resolves that are included online. Council Strezzo. Thank you, Mr. President. I was wondering if the administration uh, had any comment or uh, comment on this. They were so present. Uh, who were you asking for comment on? If there was, if there are any members of the administration present to comment on this or this proposal that I am asking for a state of emergency for this, and also if Councilor Valentine wanted to speak on this as well. Okay. Uh, are there any re uh, representatives from the city present? I do not see anyone, uh, but feel free to speak up if not. Uh, while we wait for that, uh, Councillor Valentine? I, I would say thank you very much, Mr. President, but I think uh, between Mr. Long's reading of the resolution and Ms. Councillor Strezzo's comments, uh, I, I support this. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's no city staff present right now. Uh, do you want to proceed, Councillor Strezzo? I, I just wanted to, if I may, um, 
through you uh, to Mr. Clerk if I can uh, read where I would prefer this to go. Yeah, uh, yes, please do. Thank you. Can I please have a copy of this sent to the governor's office, state and federal delegation that served Somerville, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Attorney General, the Massachusetts Women's Commission, the Somerville Commission for Women, the Human Rights Commission, the Wage Theft Committee, the Economic Development Office, and through a time machine, go to the future and pull the next future racial social justice director. And then when they arrive, please hand them this as well. So if they, they all, if all the above could have a copy of that, please. Do you have all that, Mr. Clark? No, Mr. President, I would request that Councilor Strezzo uh, forward that that list to me and I will follow through. Will do. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And thank you, Mr. President. Uh, do you want this referred to committee, Councilor Strezzo? Sure. If it can go to the, the, the Housing and Community Development Committee. Very please. good. Uh, if there's no more discussion, uh, this item will be laid on the table for approval and referred to Housing and Community Development. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Item. item number 16 is an order submitted by Councillor Strezzo and Councillor Davis that the Commissioner of Public Works repair the pedestrian crossing signals at the intersection of Bristol Road, Broadway, and Willow Avenue. Any discussion? Seeing none, this item is laid on the table for approval. Item 17 is an order by Councillor Strezzo that this Council's Committee on Housing and Community Development review the findings of the Condo Conversion Annual Report. Discussion? Nope, send it on through please, Mr. President. All right, this item will be laid on the table for approval with a copy sent to Housing and Community Development. Item 18 is an order submitted by Councilor Ewan Camp that the Committee on Housing and Community Development convene housing advocates and staff to address racial disparities in home mortgages, including programs like Boston's One Plus program to increase assistance for first time and low income home buyers. Councilor Ewan Camp. Thank you, Mr. President. So for the past 30 years or so, the Massachusetts Community and Banking Council has published a report that looks at mortgage lending across Massachusetts and breaks it down uh, looking for racial disparities in home loans. And um, if you look at these, you can get an enormous amount of data on a town-by-town on -town basis, including in Somerville. And I've provided tonight attached to this uh, the, mo the three most recent years of this report. And if, if you take a look at these, the most recent year that I provided is 2017 and look down towards the bottom of the table, you'll see Somerville. And you will see that there were 350 mortgages that went to white buyers uh, in that year in Somerville and three mortgages that went to black buyers. And for Latino buyers, the number was 12. So again, that's 350 mortgages to white buyers, three to black buyers and 12 to Latino buyers. And the numbers are very consistent in the preceding years as well. Um, I want to be very clear, this is not specific to Somerville. Uh, this is a systemic issue that affects all of Massachusetts and, in fact, the entire country. And we all know the, the kind of big picture reason here uh, is because the cost of housing in Somerville today is astronomical and increasing. And after centuries of racial discrimination at every level of policymaking in this country, there is a vast wealth and income disparity um, that falls along racial lines. But uh, the fact that the problem is vast and that there are no easy silver bullets, absolutely, as we all agree, cannot be an excuse for inaction. And, and I also don't believe that it's the, the whole story. I think that there is more that we can be doing. Um, I want to acknowledge Somerville does have a number of first time home buyer and home buying programs. And I'm, I'm very thankful for the hard work that's gone into those programs. But I've put in this order uh, to, to have us start a conversation um, with our housing division and with local nonprofits about what more can we, we can do. And I've started to have some of those conversations. Um, and one recent policy initiative that the Somerville Community Corporation raised is something recently enacted in Boston called One Plus that I wanted to flag. And this is a program where the city of Boston has created a, a dedicated uh, pool of money, a funding stream. Um, you could imagine something like the CPA doing this in Somerville that is used to basically pay down uh, the mortgage rate for, for qualified buyers so that buyers wind up with lower monthly payments and it can also help with things like closing costs. And another really important thing it does is it creates active dialogue between the city and these agencies and local lending institutions about how they assess risk uh, and, and working with them to kind of um, shepherd buyers through the home buying process. So uh, this program in just the first five months, I've been looking at some of the kind of initial data out of Boston 
Um, they've had 140 applications. There are 30 live deals. It's, it's very, very popular. 75% of those loans have gone to people of color. The average subsidy is about $15,000 per home buyer. So again, this is one example of a program that I think is worth considering. And I would ask that this go to housing and community development so that we can um, start, start fleshing out this policy and others. Thank you. All right, I see Councilor Ba, Ballantyne, Scott, Davis, Strezzo would like to all sign on. Uh, so you know for the discussion, this item is laid on the table for approval. And what committee did you say again? Housing and Community Development, please. Housing and Community Development. Next item. And number 19. We can waive the reading of this and please send it to land use. All right, Councillor Ewan Cameron moves to waive the reading, refer it to land use, laid on the table for approval, refer it to land use. And next Mr. Time. President, the same for the next two, for 20 and 21, please uh, waive the reading and refer to land use. Councillor Davis would like to sign on to 20. Uh, Councillor Ewan Cameron waives the readings of 20 and 20, 21, 22, you said? Uh, 20 and 21, Mr. President. 20 and 21 referred to land use. Yes, uh, yes, approved with a copy sent to Landius. Well, that brings us up to item number 23, which is a resolution suited by Councillor White urging the state legislature to adopt the Public Lands Preservation Act. Councillor White. Thank you, Mr. President. The Public Lands Preservation Act was recently uh, presented with state legislation, state legislature, and essentially what it does is it puts further restrictions on the ability of communities or actually state government for that matter um, to transfer out what's considered to be public lands, which would include parks, for instance, um, environmental uh, areas. And what it does is it requires um, before a community or a governmental agency can do that, that they have to undertake um, certain measures um, in order to to get the two thirds um, uh, majority approval that it needs at the state legislature. So basically what it does is it requires that replacement land of comparable acreage, fair value, location and natural resource value be provided for the disposition first. And that it also requires the, um, that alternatives be presented and also that they have to notify the executive office of energy and environmental affairs. And there's also contemplated a public process so given all the economic concerns we face in the Commonwealth, um, I think it's a well-crafted uh, bill that's designed to further protect uh, our public land. So I think it would be appropriate and, and would hope that we all sign on and have this then forwarded to the uh, state delegation and also to the um, clerk's office of the House and the Senate. Okay, looks like the entire council would like to sign on to this. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, this item is laid on the table for approval. And Ms. Clark, did you get all the uh, groups that Council White would like this to be sent to? Mr. President, I would ask uh, Council White to send me that list, please. I will certainly do so. Okay. Thank you. The item's laid on the table for approval. Next item. Item number, item number 24 is an Order submitted by Councilor White and Councilor Rossetti that the Rules Committee work with the city solicitor to establish firm procedures regarding executive sessions to ensure compliance with the open meeting law. Councilor White. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we got a little taste of that earlier. Um, it's, it's time, I think, for the board to take another look at it. The regulations um, dealing with executive sessions have, I hate to use the word tightened, but let's say the Attorney General's office has taken an approach to vigorously enforce this to ensure that there's um, you know, maximum compliance and the public does get the information that they're entitled to. So I look at it uh, at our end basically in both respects. One is we certainly don't want to do anything to violate the open meeting law. But second, I don't think we want to restrict in any way um, the information that our, that our constituents are, are able to determine. Um, and, and as a result, we do have a rule, and that rule basically needs revision, because what the rule, what the Attorney General's regulations under the Open Meeting Law require is technically that the body itself review and approve its minutes within three meetings of the executive session. Um, in our rules, we delegate that, that's permissible. 
Um, it also requires that the city council periodically meet to review executive session minutes and then release them where they're no longer applicable. Um, you know, the public uh, meeting law exception no longer applies. We've also designated that to the city clerk and the city solicitor. We can decide whether we want to continue to do that, but the rule should also require a periodic review. So let's say every six months, um, they submit a report to us and then we meet uh, to vote to release the minutes. Or if something happens where it really is no longer appropriate to have it, in, in, you know, held confidential. For instance, if we meet to discuss litigation and then the case is decided, there's a strong question whether there's, there's any need for that to remain um, sealed. So that's my hope to get that process well established. And I think we also have to deal um, and work with the city solicitor's office to make sure that we receive appropriate um, appraisals of whether it is appropriate to go into an executive session. Um, you know, I was a little concerned a couple of weeks ago, but there was a recent decision from the attorney general's office dealing with potential litigation. And basically, I think it's important to read that so we understand it, that unless that litigation is clearly and imminently threatened or otherwise demonstrably likely, that a person is represented by counsel and supports a position adverse to the public body does not itself mean that litigation is imminently threatened or likely, nor does the fact that a newspaper reports that a party has threatened to sue necessarily mean imminent litigation. So that means to me that um, we really have to take a strong look about um, whether the conditions warrant us to go into executive session we, when we discuss um, you know, potential litigation. Um, so these are all things I think that probably would make sense for the rules committee to first take a look at, um, to just, you know, to address the current rule and whether that should be amended. And also there have been some decisions as well that I think the committee, um, I'm sorry, that the council needs to be apprised of, especially with regard to deliberations. It was a recent decision where one, uh, I think it was a member of the board of selection, but anyway, sent an opinion to all members, and that was considered deliberation, even if the other members didn't comment on it. So I, I think we should get a little guide from the uh, city solicitor office, again, dealing with, with deliberation. So for all of these reasons, I, I hope that this be approved and that it be referred to the Rules Committee. All right, Councilor Davis and Klingon would like to sign on, and Councilor Scott, you had a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank uh, my colleague at large for raising this. It is absolutely appropriate and I think um, essential as a, <laughs> a consistent advocate for transparency. I've been concerned with some of the city's practices related to executive session. And quite frankly, the need to review the extensive executive session minutes that this council accrues over time, uh, be it in committee or as a council, uh, and release those as appropriate, as we undertook tonight, is a process that happens very rarely here. Um, the, that need is just another reason um, why I believe we need both our own counsel to advise us on these matters, uh, because the city solicitor's office is obviously uh, under ex extremely heavy load, uh, thanks to the efforts of the executive who it primarily serves, uh, and also that the city council requires staff and assistance in order to meet all of the uh, obligations that we have under Mass General Law in the city charter. So uh, I fully support this, um, but would also add that this city council needs more resources in order to meet its obligations under the law. Thank you. Uh, please uh, sign yeah, in. Yeah. Councilor Scott would like to sign on with the hashtag charter reform. Uh, if there's no further discussion, this item is laid on the table for approval. Will the copy sent to the Rules Committee? Item number 25 is an order submitted by Councillor Mbaugh that the Director of Health and Human Services create a vaccination site once more vaccines become available, given the number of vulnerable populations in the city. Councillor Mbaugh. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I like the way you spike meetings, you know. So uh, I'm aware that, you know, we don't have you know, enough vaccination sites because the governor hasn't created them. And of course, you know, if you ask the governor, like, why haven't you? You know, he will probably say he hasn't created them because there are not enough vaccines yet. 
but given the number of vulnerable populations that we have in our city, you know, and the challenges in navigating appointment size at the end of the day, we can expect our seniors to go to big sites like Juliet or Fenway. So it's unacceptable. It's good that we've started, you know, becoming proactive in creating those sites. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would like this to go to uh, uh, public health and public safety, please. All right. You no know, discussion. This item is laid on the table for approval and referred to public health and safety. Item 26 is communication submitted by Councillor Mba, updating this council on the racial and social justice director hiring process. Councillor Mba. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can we table this for next meeting, please? Sure. This item is laid on the table. Uh, no vote taken. Thank you. Next item. Item number, 20, item number 27 is an order submitted by Councilor Niedergang and Councilor McLaughlin, the Mayor, the Director of Infrastructure and Asset Management, and the Director of Health and Human Services. Update this council on public school reopening plans. Councilor Niedergang. Mr. President, just like to send this to public health and public safety. There's already some similar orders in there. Very Thank good. You. Councilor Klingon would like to sign on. Seeing no discussion, this item's late. And Ballantyne. Uh, seeing no discussion, this item's laid on the table for approval. And Ba. I refer to public health and safety. Item uh, number 28 is a uh, communication suited by Councilor Rossetti reporting on the high school building committee meeting on of February 22. Councilor Rossetti. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're in the final phase of the project. Uh, there has been some more asbestos discovered, so I just wanted to let you all become aware. I know. Um, my colleague, Councilor Scott, will be reporting some of this in finance committee meeting that was held under his report. Um, but the temporary certificate of occupancy has finally been issued this past Friday to the high school building. So uh, staff has been moving inside and, and preparing for education, which is very, very good news. Um, there is a 3D tour link that the um, SMMA, Matt Rice, shared with the committee that evening, which is now posted up on the city's webpage for the high school building committee. It's a very, um, I know I forwarded it to all of you, my colleagues. I hope you share it with your constituency because it's a 3D tour link. It's really cool to see exactly what it looks like inside behind those walls right now. Um, I won't go into the asbestos. If there's any questions, you can um, check with me or check the minutes of the meeting. But um, there are two discoveries of asbestos in this last phase of destruction and of uh, taking the building down. And a pipe has also been discovered in the underground grass in that area where the new field will be placed. So um, every, everything had to stop while that was uh, taken care of by state statute and rules. And um, now the removal of the demolition of the building has to be treated differently. It's also a costly um, situation. I know I've spoken in the past. I wanted to let you know that because of this asbestos discovery, the field's timeline has moved now. Instead of being ready September um, of this year, it's been moved up to February of 2022, where the field hopefully will be completed. Uh, the auditorium section of this uh, certificate of occupancy is not included. The auditorium will be available by June of this year. Um, the budget itself, our contingency line, I've always been expressing concern. And in December's meeting, we were in a negative 1.4 million. And February's meeting, we are now in the negative of 2.8 million. Um, so there is still lines within the budget that have not been fully expended I've been watching those closely. I've been asking for further um, detailed updates by um, our project manager and, and leadership team in this project to um, look close, more closely at the numbers because to already be close to $3 million um, in the red on our contingency line is not a good thing. Some of it is related to the asbestos. A lot of it is, um, some of it is also related to COVID costs and um, we talked about that with Mr. Bean, not only in this meeting, but also in the finance meeting, which Councilor Scott will be reporting out. 
Additionally, we're a little bit over budget due to costs that coincide with the green line that the high school project took on. And um, so uh, Ed did come before the finance committee to replenish some of the monies back to the high school project, but it's still not enough. So we'll continue this discussion and further reporting of the funding um, and the finance situation as it relates to this project. The next meeting is scheduled for March 15th at 4.30. Um, virtual meeting, but of course open to the public, and there is a public comment period in the, every meeting that we have every month. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, on the item, Councilor Skezno. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Just a quick question to uh, through you to Councilor Rossetti. Where was the asbestos found? Was it found on the field? There was asbestos discovered in phase one of the project. We're now on the final phase, phase three. So there was asbestos discovered in underneath a plastered ceiling in the demo of this West Wing. And additionally, a pipe was discovered underground. Not sure yet how long that pipe is. Depends on the length. It's wrapped in asbestos. So it depends on the length of that pipe as to the impact to, to the cost. But that's still to be determined. They have they had to stop digging once they discovered it. There's a huge process that must be followed by state statute, which this project has been following from day one. Um, it's it's another unfortunate discovery, sometimes not expected in old sites like this, but um, we're being hit again by asbestos. By asbestos. Thank you. Councilor Kungan. Uh, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> Mr. President, sorry, through you to uh, Councilor Rosetti. Um, so, Councilor Rosetti, you said this, the temporary certificate of occupancy has been issued. That's correct? Um, I'm just asking because I know that we're literally the next week expecting students to be to be using the, the new high school. And, um, you know, I'm, it's my understanding that there's like some, there's some fume smells that are still in the building and some other issues around cleaning, like whether or not, you know, it will be done. But do, you, do you have any information on the, the uh, you know, the specifics on whether or not it's it's education ready. It will be education ready by by Monday, or uh, you're not going to reach any of that. Uh, the certificate of occupancy means it's ready to be used. Now it's in the hands of the superintendent um, and her staff to have. Now that the teachers can actually enter the building and start setting things up, that is underway right now. Um, we didn't go into the finite details of when will education um, resume because it's not the it's not under the auspice of the high school building committee. But I did in my report of was either November or December's committee meeting report. I went off on that venue to the superintendent as one individual and and suggested that she take the leadership here and reverse the role of instead of waiting for the city to tell her when it's okay she and the school committee start working on making it okay and and um you know so we're getting closer she i i she had to leave this meeting um in the middle of the meeting so we didn't have a close dialogue with the superintendent because she had a conflict with the school committee meeting um but to my understanding the building is starting to be put together for use of children and staff and the headmaster did commend um the architect and suffolk for what the headmaster relayed as staff loving the building. Um, that was relayed by, there is, there is a teacher rep also serving on this committee and everybody was praising how beautiful and how happy they were about the building. So whatever aroma you're speaking to is the first I've heard of it. Nobody else mentioned it. So if there is okay, a aroma right. concern by anybody, I would have them speak with um, the headmaster who serves on this committee sure. also. Sure, and thank you for that. And it's exciting. I think you know. I just I know that we're in a rush to get uh, children back into school, and I just I you know I just hope that we're not uh, we're you know we're we're not rushing it too fast, so we're uh, we're not fully prepared for uh, for student learning. So, but I just want to raise that concern as it was brought to me. So, thank you. Oh no, thank you, Councillor Ba. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Rosetti, for all the work you've done, you know, and always updating us about the high school. I guess the question I have is uh, just, you know, are we going to virtually cut the ribbon maybe next week or something prior to the 
building being used or like what is the plan? There is, uh, through you, Mr. President, there is no plan right now. We have a meeting again um, in March. Um, I have not physically been in that building um, at all, except for a walkthrough we had, uh, I forget when it was, it was quite some time ago. Um, but um, there is no ribbon cutting ceremony underway that I'm aware of. Okay. No, just, you know, that's why I asked about virtually since we are all in this virtual space and given the scale and the magnitude of the building, you know, if it's ready to be used, at least we should, you know, like celebrate the little uh, uh, accomplishment that we're able to get. To. <laughs> all right. Seeing no further discussion, this item is laid on the table and placed on file. Next item. Uh, number 30 is a report uh, is a, yeah, a report uh, submitted by Councillor Strezzo reporting on the Children's Cabinet. There's an item of unfinished business. Councillor Strezzo. Let's work through it. It'll be quick. Uh, colleagues, um, I have two months to go through, but I will submit the January meeting uh, minutes to um, our clerk talked about uh, a lot of uncertainties with the school, with the, with the school reopening plan, at least this was in January, um, and also worked on, on um, bringing in more, uh, more to the children's cabinet, uh, more voices as necessary, including special education, uh, youth advisory council. Um, these minutes will be, that was January's minute meeting uh, in, in February talking about summer programming or the beginning of, of creating the foundation for whatever summer programming will look like in 2021. Um, some, some grants were, at, were announced. There are also, uh, also there um, through Dignity Matters, there will be 100 women that will get uh, free maxi pads that help those with, um, help those that uh, do not have access to it, uh, some of our poorest of families. I was proud to be helpful in that work. It's, it's really vitally important for women. Um, the diaper program um, is in desperate need of donations of diapers. So if you can pass it along to constituents, um, that donations, diaper donations are needed. And um, that's about it. Thank you very much. All right, seeing no discussion, this item is laid on the table and placed on file. Uh, before we get to the finance, uh, the committee reports, uh, we're about halfway through the agenda. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, WandaVision comes on at 3 o'clock a.m., 12 o'clock California time. So if people would like to stay up, uh, please continue. Uh, but if you'd like to get some sleep tonight, uh, you know what you need to do. So next item, Mr. Clerk. Item 34 is a report of the Committee on Finance, which met on February 23rd. Councilor Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the committee met on February 23rd for an hour and a half, but I'm very excited for one division so I can try to make this report last uh, at least twice that long. Uh, the committee discussed three categories of items. Uh, there were some mid-year physician requests uh, from the administration. Just to be clear on that, these are new positions that were not budgeted in last year's budget, and if approved, um, while their salaries could be paid out of lag monies this year, meaning um, leftover monies from previously funded positions that have been sitting vacant, uh, it would create a future obligation on the city to fund those positions in next year's budget. Uh, so it is uh, functionally setting aside uh, a portion of future year's budgets if these are approved this evening. Uh, there was a discussion about DIF funding requests and then a number of stabilization fund transfers and discussion about free cash. So just briefly, uh, the positions being requested uh, was one position from the libraries for a manager of branch services. This would be a new position in uh, the West Branch Library that would act as a supervisor for the West Branch, as well as um, have duties overseeing uh, 
temporary and pop-up branch uh, operations around the city, including Assembly Row or Union Square and other places. So this, um, the West Branch position was not eliminated during the pandemic. However, uh, a person who was in that role has retired. It would be anticipated that that position would also be hired for uh, at the conclusion of the pandemic or when the branch reopens after construction. Uh, that item was recommended for approval. There was also a discussion of two new positions being created uh, in executive office to supposedly report to the non-existent racial and social justice director. Uh, there was extensive discussion in committee on this. Um, I'll leave the rationale, uh, which is well described in the minutes, uh, but it was the belief of the majority of the committee that uh, it would not be appropriate to hire, to begin a hiring process um, in the creation of a department that did not have a director to start the path of that department or even potentially interview the candidates. Um, so that item remains a committee with the intention being that whenever a racial and social justice director is in fact hired, um, that I may call a SNAP meeting of the Finance Committee uh, at its earliest opportunity to meet that person and discuss with them their staffing uh, needs and plan for plan for their program. Uh, there was diff, so that, that item was kept in committee. The diff funding request is $55,000 uh, of free cash for a consultant to, uh, to put it in layman's terms, to create some fancy bonding analysis for how the city could uh, work on sewer and water infrastructure uh, and other infrastructure needs, basically how to fancy ways to bond against future tax revenue in Boynton Yards, Clarendon Hill, and Union Square. Uh, this was recommended for approval. And then finally, there was a series of stabilization fund transfers from free cash um, in total, I believe this is close to uh, six, seven million dollars uh, of free cash. We had certified uh, close to 17 million dollars in free cash at the recap here, which is not quite record levels, but very close to record levels, which is to say that uh, after expenses and management, um, are we underspent our budget in terms of real estate taxes received and revenues received by the city uh, by close to $17 million during a pandemic year. Uh, this is appropriating some of these funds to replenish the rainy day stabilization fund, uh, the street reconstruction resurfacing fund, and the capital stabilization fund. Uh, we had withdrawn monies from each of those funds to create uh, the Small Business Emergency Relief Fund. So this is putting that money back using our excess cash from last year. Uh, the only thing that was a little bit more involved was a discussion about appropriating close to $2 million of free cash to the Facility Construction and Renovation Stabilization Fund. This is the piece that Council Rossetti was speaking about earlier. Um, the cost overruns on high school are considerable, and the only ways to deal with those uh, amount over budget is to either bond for more money, which would require either authorization of the city council uh, or authorization under um, the override that had been um, approved or also including override that's been approved by uh, the voters several years ago. Um, there was an interesting discussion about whether or not to surface that by doing an extra bond request uh, or just to use our extra pocket change and pound on the couch this year. Uh, uh, the, Mr. Bean's recommendation is to use the free cash for it. And after discussion, all members of the committee voted in favor of that. So all of the stabilization fund transfers are recommended for approval. And uh, I encourage you to watch the meeting. It's a short one or read the minutes, which are lovingly put together. Uh, with that, I ask that the report be accepted as submitted. All right, Council Scott moves to accept the committee report as submitted. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, let's please call the roll to accept the committee report. Here's a roll call vote on the acceptance of the Finance Committee report just presented. Councillor Niedergang. Yes. 
Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Mba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 uh, councillors have voted in favor of approval. The Finance Committee report has been approved. Okay. So we have several items that require a roll call vote. We could do them separately or all at once. Uh, does anyone object to doing them all together? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll on the items that require roll call vote. Mr. President, there are four items that require roll call vote. They are all appropriations to the stabilization funds, as, as the chair described, uh, replenishing or either bolstering reserves or replenishing reserves. They are item numbers 211270, 271, 272, and 273. So on the approval of all four of those, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Mba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 councillors have voted in favor of uh, that motion. All four of those stabilization fund appropriations have been approved. All right, next item. Brings us up to item number 35, which is reported committee on land use, which met on February 16th. Councillor Ewan Kappen. <laughs> My apologies, Mr. President. Um, the Committee on Land Use met on February 16th. We discussed a number of items that will be before us in a public hearing, a joint public hearing with the Planning Board next Tuesday. Um, I encourage all of you to look through these. They're, they're relatively minor amendments, but some of them may be of interest. Um, they're described in a, in a packet provided by Mr. Bartment. Um, we had a, a brief discussion about um, moving forward on uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing amendment. Um, uh, work will, will happen on that sort of offline and then come back to the committee once, once we've made some progress. And Councillor Niedergang introduced um, a, a motion to allow tattoo parlors on pedestrian streets. Um, the, the, that is now going to be formulated as a, a formal amendment that will be submitted to the um, committee, there was unanimous support for that. Um, I would encourage anyone interested in the details to watch the uh, uh, video or read the minutes. Thank you. I ask that the uh, report be accepted as submitted. All right, Council, you and Kevin moves to accept the committee report as submitted. Seeing no discussion, the item is laid on the table for approval. Item number 36 is a report of the committee on legislative matters, which met on February 18th. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the committee uh, did meet on the 13th. Um, all members were present with the exception of Councilor Klingen, who was uh, participating in a committee meeting uh, that was happening at the same time, uh, confirmation of appointments, I believe. Um, there were a number of items discussed, um, and we actually have, um, we have at least one separate item that we'll have to take up I believe if the clerk can correct me, uh, if clerk can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that all of the other items, I believe we only have the one item number 43 that we'll need to take up um, after the minutes um, or, or replace it or whatever the process is. Um, but if I missed one going through, then somebody please uh, holler. Um, we, the bulk of the discussion was about the surveillance technology uh, ordinance, the surveillance technology uh, use policy and the related impact reports that we've been discussing for a long time. Um, <clears throat> I won't go into a whole lot of detail on the, on the substance um, because we've discussed it ad nauseum, but the, there was a, a um, 
one substantive change both to the ordinance and the policy that was made was to um, essentially to add the fire department to the exception for exigent circumstances. So the ordinance and, and the, the associated policies have a provision that says that right now that if the, if the chief of police determines that there is a, an urgent situation, uh, an emergency, some sort of you know, um, significant need to use a technology that isn't otherwise already approved, uh, they can they can do so, and then there's a process for then uh, disclosing that and and you know ensuring transparency um, soon thereafter. And uh, if essentially, the fire department wanted to, to felt th that it was appropriate to have the same um, have that same consideration. The committee agreed unanimously. So that uh, there there is in the uh, bundle of documents a revision to the ordinance itself, uh, adding the fire department, and then uh, the policy will reflect that as well. Um, also subject to the same follow-up um, communications and, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> we talked again about this, the, uh, the use policy, which is the sort of guiding document that sits under the ordinance. We've go been going back and forth on this for a long time, and uh, essentially we, we ultimately came to, uh, to agreement. Um, this is a, the administration's document. Uh, it's not something that the council could vote on amendments to, so we really had to work together to make sure that we were all on the same page. Um, and we ultimately were, uh, including with, with Lieutenant DeGregorio from the police department who's been assisting us throughout all this. So uh, the council recommended approval of the, uh, of the revised um, general use policy. And then there were several um, impact reports that were, uh, that were submitted. Um, and we uh, recommended approval of all of those. There were some amendments that were made to some of them. Um, I, I try to look at there was an one exception for one that was um, that was new, but I'm just looking through the report to refresh my recollection because it's so late, and I usually can do this off the top of my head. But um, so the the good news is that um, we now have uh, we have our, our ordinances in place. We now have a policy in place. We now have uh, impact reports. There is a great degree of transparency throughout all of these. Um, thank you to Councilor Campen for his assistance on this as well. Um, I'm really happy and proud of where we all uh, ended up with this um, and appreciate the help of the administration, the police department, the fire department as well uh, on all that. So um, with that, uh, that, that, was, that was that topic. We also discussed the other item um, that I wanted to raise because we have to take a, a vote um, is the home rule petition to change the pronouns in the city charter to be gender neutral. Um, if you recall, we, we sort of bifurcated this issue. So there's a, now a separate order that, uh, that addresses the city ordinances, which of course are much longer. Um, and, uh, but we have, we have before us tonight um, uh, changes to the city charter. Um, a, uh, an intern with the, uh, the um, school service office, Mr. Salamini, um, helped to do the, the legwork on that, did a great job. Um, and that document in red line form is, uh, is attached to the uh, to minute track. We also have a home rule petition that is attached um, that uh, we recommended approval. So if, uh, if it's the will of the council, we will, um, we will uh, vote tonight and then we'll, we'll send that up on its way. And, and at least our, uh, our city charter will, um, will have those changes if and when the, uh, uh, the state legislature approves it. So. Um, with that, I um, uh, let's see. So let's let I will move to accept the um, minutes as submitted, and then after that, I will I will move to take up item forty three, uh, which is the home rule petition. Unless Mr. Clark, tell you tell me that that's not the way to do it for some reason. Uh, through the through the chair, exactly correct, uh, okay. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Davis moves to accept the committee report as submitted. In our discussion, please call the roll on accepting the committee report. Uh, Councilor Ballantyne. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, through you to the chair, um, could you clarify um, the words in the home rule petition uh, that changed the word chair to chairperson? Or excuse me, uh, or in some places maybe said chairman. I, I was, since we tend to use the language chair, I was curious 
why the word chair wasn't used and chairperson was. I didn't understand the distinction. Yeah, so I'm trying to find the. Ah, I do see a couple instances of that. Yeah, for the, for the most part, they uh, we used sort of a shorter versions, but I do see that that um, that chairperson was used, and I have no. Um, there, there was no sort of substantive discussion on that. Um, it was accepted as submitted by this by the solicitor's office. Happy to uh, entertain a, a, an amendment if that would be um, if if, you, if folks would prefer. I, I I agree with you. I do use try and use chair rather than chairperson. Um, and, and speaking, you know, though in the ordinance uh, or in the in the charter, I, I don't I don't believe there's any distinction. So. Unless, unless, uh, Councilor, uh, Solicitor Shapiro is, I don't know if he's still here or not, but uh, I don't see him. Everyone's asleep. Yeah. If you'd like, Councilor Valentine, it's, it's a fair question. I, I don't know if there's a, I, I doubt there's a distinction, um, but with, you know, with all things charter, because they it becomes a feature of the statute, um, I'd always defer, you know, I always just be a little hesitant. I, we could, we could always leave this one. Uh, in and just get a get a definitive answer from the solicitor's, solicitor's office and, and ask them to, to to just do a cut, a cut and replace if, if if you'd like. I don't I would imagine there'd be an objection to that. Um, you know, this is a, while it's important to to get this changed, it's you know it's certainly nothing that's critically urgent. We, we have a, a strong preference. Yeah. So I I um I just would we're we're so used to saying chair. So does that mean then that we would start saying chairperson? I just wanted to to be clear, and if I understand it's late at night, and if uh, uh, if I could indulge my colleagues, I would just ask that we find out if there's a distinction between those those two words um, that matters in terms of the charter, because I think I I would prefer to stay with the word chair. Okay. I, I have no objection through you, uh, Mr. President, to Council Valentine. I have no objection to that, and, and Mr. President, uh, to that end, if I uh, then would move to have uh, item 43 sent to the Committee on Legislative Matters. Very good. Well, let's. Uh, I don't. Well, let's get to. Let's do the roll call vote first on the committee report. Um, yes. And well, let's just say item 43 is referred to Legislative Matters. Uh, roll call vote on the committee report. On the committee report, on approval of the committee report, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Mba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 councilors have voted in favor of the approval of the Legislative Matters Committee report. Sorry, right, muted. Uh, we have a roll call vote on enrollment and ordainment on an item. Correct, Mr. President. We have uh, now before us the ordinance uh, item number 211312, which amends the surveillance technology ordinance with respect to the fire department as the chair described. Roll call vote. Please call the roll. On enrollment, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councilor Strezzo. Yes. Councilor Klingen. Yes. Councilor Mba. Yes. Councilor Scott. Yes. Councilor Rossetti. Yes. And Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 councilors voted in favor of enrollment. That brings ordainment before this body. All right, on ordainment. On ordainment, Councilor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. 
Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Mba. Councillor Mba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Again, Mr. President, all 11 councils are voted in favor. That ordinance has now been ordained. Okay. Next item. Oh, that brings us up to item number 37, which is report of the Committee on Open Space, Environment, and Energy, which met on February 17th. Council of Valentine. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee met on February 17th. We discussed and reviewed two ordinances on the native species and banning plastic utensils. I invited in comments from the public. These two items were left in committee. There was further discussion about EV charging stations, updates on the Commission of Energy Use and Climate Change, the Somerville Climate Forward Plan. Um, the complete meeting minutes can be found on the City of Somerville's website, and I ask that the committee report be accepted as submitted. Excellent committee report, Council Valentine. Any discussion? Seeing none, the committee report is laid on the table for approval. That brings us to item number 38, which is a request to the mayor requesting adoption of an order of taking for 9 to 11 Aldersey Street for historic open space and affordable housing purposes. Councilor Scott, any uh, preference on this? Uh, Councilor uh, Youngkamp is refused. Refer to committee, please. Okay. Uh, how about, can we waive the readings of any of this? Or are you trying to approve? Uh, I would ask that you waive, you can waive the read of turn nine and refer to committee. Uh, I would ask that number 40 be waived and read or uh, waived and approved tonight. Uh, okay. so it is just a $5,000 grant for exercise programs for the Council on Aging. All right, 38 and 39 are referred to the Finance Committee. We'll lay uh, item number 40 on the table and come back to it. Very good. That brings us to item number 44, which is an order submitted by Councillor Strezzo and Councillor Niedergang that the Director of Health and Human Services and the Director of the Human Rights Commission advise the Committee on Housing and Community Development how the city can address reported cases of suspected hate speech on public and private property. Councillor Strezzo. Thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, self explanatory. I've been working uh, along with. Uh, as several counselors have been to really uh, examine hate speech or how this, what this looks like in our community and how to report it. I'm looking forward to the dialogue and uh, if Councilor Nieder Gang has something to say. Hey, Councilor Ballantyne would like to sign on. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the sign is laid on the table for approval. And let's send a copy to Housing Community Development. Next that side. brings us up to item number 46. Sorry, Council Ballantyne wanted to sign on there. I didn't say that already. Okay, item number 46 is a request to the mayor requesting approval of the attached uh, 2021 local election calendar. Is that we refer to legislative matters? Item uh, 47. Mr. Well, President, I ask that you waive the reading of 47 through 51 and refer to finance. All right, Councilor Scott moves to waive 47 to 51. Uh, they will be referred to the Finance Committee. And I would ask that you read 52 for approval tonight. Uh, item 52, Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, sorry, may I just make a very quick comment about items uh, 48 through 51, please? Yes, just to be clear, Council Ewan Cameron is recused from item 47. Council Anita again. Uh, thank you. Just wanted to say that the administration has asked the council to approve the creation of three new positions in the mobility division. I just wanted uh, everybody to be aware of that and encourage you to read the memo that provides the rationale for those new positions and for some $50,000 that would be spent on professional and technical services to be 
transferred. These are all uh, funds to be transferred for the current fiscal year. That's an item uh, 53, that memo. Just wanted to encourage everybody to take a look at that. We have the uh, Somerville Alliance for Safe Streets Summit coming up on, on Sunday. So it's a very time, these are timely requests. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do anticipate these being on the agenda for March 9th. Very good. These items are, are referred to the Finance Committee. Uh, the request was to read 52 and then to refer 53, um, waive the reading of 53 and refer to finance. All right. 53 is referred to the Finance Committee. Um, placed on, laid on the table, placed on file, referred to finance. And please read number 52. Item 52 is a request to the mayor requesting acceptance of a $45,200 grant with no new match required from the Mass Cultural Council to the Arts Council for support of the local Cultural Council re-grant program. Council Scott. Uh, this is just passing through funds from the state to local artists, uh, and I would request that it be approved this evening. All right. This item is laid on the table for approval. Yep. Mr. President, item number 54 is a communication from Custer University submitting comments with respect to uh, agenda item number 12, which was Councilor Ballantyne's item with respect to campus COVID rates. All right, this item is laid on the table, placed on file. And Mr. President, there are just uh, late items from Councilor Niedergang and Councilor White okay. that I'm aware of. The item from Councillor Niedergang is an order uh, co-sponsored by Councillor Mba that the city that this city council review and consider supporting and advocating with the administration for the additional $750,000 fiscal 2022 budget request described within for safe streets and equitable mobility to enhance public safety and prevent serious injury and death in our streets. Any discussion, Councillor Niedergang? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd just like to ask uh, Councillor Scott to, I'd like to ask these to be referred to finance, obviously, and ask if Councillor Scott can also put them on the agenda for the March 9th meeting. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Uh, Councillor Valentine would like to sign on. Councillor Scott? I believe these are redundant with previous items, but I'm happy to put them on the agenda and we'll talk about them. All right. This item is laid on the table for approval and referred to the Finance Committee. Councilor Niedergang, Oba. Yes, I want to say these are, these are new requests, Mr. K Mr. Uh, uh, President. These have not been submitted uh, previously. Uh, there's four different items totaling 750000 Thank you. All right. Ba. Uh, no, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Just to, you know, like substantiate that this is the time where we have to put our money where our mouth is. Thank you, Mr. President. All right. Uh, I laid on the table for approval. We'll refer to the Finance Committee. Next item. We have a late uh, order submitted by Councillor White that the Director of Capital Projects appear before this council to discuss whether the OSHA record of violations is used as a factor in determining the successful bidder for city contracts. Mm, Councillor White. Mr. President, if the clerk could please read the next item, they're both related. Please read the next item, Mr. Clerk. And the next and last item that I'm aware of is an order submitted by Councilor White. The Director of Inspectional Services appear before this council to discuss whether the Office of Inspectional Services does or may use the OSHA record of applicants for permits. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, does or may use the OSHA record of applicants for permits as a factor in determining whether to issue the permit. Councilor White. Thank you, Mr. President. Very briefly, Councilor Kling, in his moment of silence, you know, brought out the, the, the very severe accident that took place in Boston. And I believe that the party that may, you know, that's allegedly responsible had a record of OSHA violations. So I think it sort of brings a bell for us as a city to take a look at um, whether when we review bids, that's a factor that's taken into account because if someone has OSHA violations in the past, um, I, I would think it should be a factor where we would not award a contract to them. And similarly, when folks come for uh, permits before um, inspectional services, whether it's possible for them uh, to look at that as well. This, you know, this may one way, one way for us 
to both help employees and, and, and our residents here to make sure that we don't have, um, you know, contract to uh, have a record of a safety violation with their workers. And I guess if, it, if both of them could we be referred to um, public utilities and public works. Very good. Councilor Strezzo, Klingen, and Ba would like to sign on, and Scott. Um, seeing no further discussion, these items are laid on the table for approval and referred to Public Utilities Public Works. Very good, Mr. President. I am not aware of any further items before this council. All right. Well, let's take all remaining items off the table and do a roll call vote for approval. Mr. President, this is a roll call vote on the approval of items 3 through 21, 23 through 25, 27, 35, 37, 40, 44 and 45, 52, and then a late item by Councillor Niedergang and two late items by Councillor White, as well as placing on file items 22, 28, 30, and 54. All right, please call the roll. On that motion, Councillor Niedergang. Yes. Councillor White. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Mba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 councillors have uh, unanimously approved that motion. Okay. Councillor Klingen moves to adjourn. Uh, seeing no discussion, please call the roll. On adjournment, Councillor Nudegang. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Ballantyne. Yes. Councillor Ewan Campen. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Strezzo. Yes. Councillor Klingen. Yes. Councillor Mba. Yes. Councillor Scott. Yes. Councillor Rossetti. Yes. And Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Mr. President, all 11 councillors have voted in favor of adjourning. All right, I'll say this. We're doing a good job at ending by midnight. So I'll count that as a victory. We are adjourned. Good night, everybody.